Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Whenever you happen to be listening to this show, I will give you that greeting. I said, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Thank you for listening. This is the Matt Blaze Show. I am your host, Matt Blaze. I want to remind you to please like and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching this on YouTube. You could also hear this on iTunes, it on, on SoundCloud, maybe it might be on Facebook. Who knows? Definitely, though, it is on YouTube, as you should see the video of my logo that is up. Now, I want to thank you all for the responses and the views that I got on the Michael Jackson Video Vanguard Award um, that I did a few weeks ago, about a month ago now. And I got some good responses on it. I got some likes. Again, please, if you like it, like and subscribe. Subscribe to the channel so I can bring you more content and share it. Don't forget, you can share this video. Share it to your friends. Share it on your Facebook page. Share it wherever you want. Let it get out there, man. We are spreading the word about how these two morons and this director are smearing the name of who I say is arguably the greatest entertainer ever lived. That would be the one and the only Michael Jackson. And there has been some more developments that have happened in the last few weeks that I want to talk about. I did want to talk about it sooner, but I, you know, I had a, I had a cold and I, I was sick and uh, my voice was horrible. I, I, I get this like, Deep like, hey, baby. I get like what I call the Barry White voice. Where I'm like, hey, baby, come on over, baby. But it's just, it's just disgusting. I don't sound like me. And I just didn't want that out there forever. Because once I put it out there, it's there. Anybody could take it, download it, record it, do whatever. I just didn't want my voice sounding like that. And then after I started getting better, what ends up happening is my voice, after I talk for a while, starts to get hoarse, and I start losing it, and then it sounds even worse. So I figured, you know what, let me wait until I am fully healed, and I could speak like a normal person in my normal voice, and then I will do my next video uh, about Michael Jackson, because there, are, like I said, there's been some new developments that have happened in the last few weeks. Oh, and by the way, if you're looking at the logo right now, we're going to switch it. I figured I'm, I have a YouTube channel now. I must use this YouTube channel to my advantage. And who wants to look at the Matt Blaze Show logo? I mean, I love my logo. Don't get me wrong. Again, like, subscribe, share the Matt Blaze Show wherever you can. But people just don't want to look at my stupid logo. It's not really great to look at. It's not that big of a deal. So I am going to do this. There you go. We're going to have a slideshow of pictures of the one and the only, the greatest entertainer that ever lived, Michael Jackson. So you can enjoy those while you're listening to me speaking. I have a lot of pictures up there. So you can look at them throughout his illustrious career, as I will say. Now, the first thing, I want to go back. We're going to go back about, what, a month ago now that the HBO documentary, Leaving Neverland, actually won an Emmy Award at the Creative Arts Emmys, whatever the fuck that is. It's some award show that they do, I believe, before the actual Emmys. So it wasn't on TV. I'm, I guess they made mention of it. I didn't watch the Emmys, uh, so I don't know if they did or they didn't. But Leaving Neverland won an Emmy uh, 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 for the, what is it? The nonfiction special category, that's what it is. The outstanding documentary or nonfiction special category produced by Dan Reed and executive produced by Nancy Abraham and Lisa Heller. So Dan Reed now could say he is a da at an Emmy Award winning documentary maker. I, maybe he said that before. I don't know what else this guy has done besides this hit job that he did on Michael Jackson, which he, which he knew from the beginning would garner him all the attention because he's doing this documentary about Michael Jackson. 
which, by the way, do you know this guy had the nerve in the beginning when the documentary first came out way back in March? This guy had the nerve to actually say that the documentary was never about Michael Jackson, which makes zero sense. The entire documentary is about Michael Jackson. The entire documentary is about Wade Robson and James Savechuk and what they're saying Michael Jackson did to them, the sexual abuse allegations. But listen to what this guy said. This was back in March. He said that it was not about Michael. The film was never about Michael Jackson. This is a quote. And I don't really know that much about Michael Jackson is what he told Billboard, admitting that he didn't really have any knowledge of or engagement with Jackson's story prior to working on the documentary. Now, you got to find that a little hard to believe. Dan Reed isn't an old guy who would be totally out of touch with society. I mean, I don't know how old he is. He looks like he must be in his, I don't know, 50s, 40s, something like that. So to tell me that you had absolutely no clue about what had been ongoing with Michael Jackson over the last two and a half decades about these allegations being brought up against him, first back in the 90s, then again in 2005, that you had no clue about any of it, sounds a little bit out of whack to me. How do you not know? How did everybody know there was some kind of allegation? You might not know the explicit details, which a lot of people didn't know, but you knew or you had to have known that Michael Jackson was accused of sexual misconduct and was on trial in 2005. You had to have known that. I mean, how would you not have known something like that? So it makes no sense to say you didn't know anything about it. So then he says, after hiring a researcher to delve deeper into the story of Jackson's accuser, a court case surfaced that involved Robson and Safechuck versus the Jackson estate. While Reed did not know if their stories were true at the time, he thought that they might be prepared to go on camera, which could be the beginning of something. Oh, you think? You think they'd want to go on camera, you know, after they're suing The Jackson estate for $100 million, you know, years after Michael Jackson died. Maybe they'd want to go on camera to share their so-called story since Wade Robson is such a fucking media whore. He went on the Today Show with the real sexual abuser, uh, Matt Lauer, who has resigned or got fired and is now in exile at his house in the Hamptons because of what he did. This this is a guy who had a button under his desk to lock the door when women came in. So you want to talk about somebody who uh, abused his power for his own sexual gratification, talk to Matt Lauer. He knew all about it. So Wade Robson in 2013 went on the Today Show with Matt Lauer to spew this nonsense about Michael, and even then, Matt Lauer even at least had uh, the notion to ask the guy, well, why are you saying this now when in 2005 you said on the stand that Michael never did anything? And then Wade Robson comes up with this bullshit answer about how he's now come to terms, he's now realized it, he was protecting Michael, all that other nonsense that he used what sexual assault victims say. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying what sexual assault victims say is nonsense. I am saying that Wade Robson, the biggest scumbag on the planet, is using that as an excuse because he knows that people usually have or should have some sympathy and empathy for people that really were sexually abused and assaulted. I don't believe for a second that this guy was sexually abused or assaulted, nor do I believe that James Safechuck was sexually abused or assaulted. I think they are using this narrative of what people who really are sexually abused say and trying to use it to their benefit. So that's what I mean when I say that. 
so now he was saying in March about how it was never about Michael Jackson. If we can begin to tell that bigger story to the world that it doesn't matter if it's Michael Jackson or the priest or the guy next door or the uncle or the beloved family friend that you trusted with your tri- with your child. That's really great positive difference that we can make. As he explained about leaving Neverland, they're telling the story and uh, saying that they are in a position to educate people about how this kind of grooming child sexual abuse really goes on. Well, if that's so true, Dan Reed, you fucking hypocrite, then why didn't you have anyone else who was sexually assaulted by a priest or the beloved family friend or an uncle, like you just said in this interview from March, why weren't any of those people in this documentary? If it was only about sexual abuse survivors and what they have to go through moving forward. Why is it called Leaving Neverland? Why does it only document the supposed relationships between Wade Robson and Michael Jackson and the relationship between James Safechuck and Michael Jackson? Why were there never anyone else who was sexually abused by, like you say, a beloved family friend, an uncle, or a priest, or the guy next door? Nobody else except for these two on a documentary in a story that's called Leaving Neverland, but it's not about Michael Jackson. So there's lie number one that you started telling back in March. Unbelievable how this guy has used the Michael Jackson name, the talent, the notoriety of Michael Jackson, who doesn't know who he is, who wasn't a fan, I mean, you might not have been the biggest fan, but everybody is a, was a fan on some kind of level, I think. You can't say that all is. Maybe you're not the biggest fan, but you're not going to say that every song he ever wrote was horrible. You might, you know, hum a tune here or there. But how could you now come out and say all this nonsense that it wasn't about Michael Jackson when clearly it's about Michael Jackson? Clearly that's what it was about because you didn't say, hey, I'm going to make a documentary about sexual assault and sexual abuse, and I'm going to get all victims of sexual abuse together and we'll sit in a group setting and we'll let them talk about their feelings and what it felt and how long did it take for them to come out to realize this. None of that happens. Not none of that. You know what happens is you have an interview with these two schmucks who go on there and talk in graphic nature about what Michael allegedly did to them and made them do. And that brings me now to my next point about what Dan Reed said. So Dan Reed firing back about what Dave Chappelle said about him. So Dave Chappelle in his stand-up comedy Netflix special, Sticks and Stones, basically goes off and says, I don't believe these two guys. I don't believe these two guys whatsoever. I, I could care less about them. And he says that they're liars. He says, Chappelle goes, I don't believe these motherfuckers. That's what he said. And the director, Dan Reed, rips into... Dave Chappelle, you know what he says? You want to talk about a hypocrite? He goes, he goes, I felt physically sick. Really? You mean to tell me you put out this documentary, right, where James Safechuck and Wade Robson allegedly make these accusations, right? They make accusations that allegedly, I should say, Michael Jackson when they were little boys, made them spread their assholes on the bed so he can look at them. And now you're saying that you felt physically sick over the jokes Dave Chappelle made because he doesn't believe these two fucks? That's the whole reason. See, that's what these people don't understand. And they, they make it like it's a knock 
and it's something against sexual abuse survivors and victims when it's not. It's a, a knock against these three people. And I'm putting Dan Reed in there because he's the one who perpetuated all this bullshit. He, they're the ones that we don't believe. It's not we don't believe all sexual abuse survivors. And Chappelle goes, I'm a victim blamer. Because he's saying, I don't believe these two guys. And I'm saying it. And we've become this culture, right? We were living in a culture now where you're not supposed to ever say that you don't believe somebody. Where we're just supposed to believe everybody because they said something like they wouldn't lie about this. That there's no motive. Well, I don't know. I could think of a hundred million motives that James Safechuck and Wade Robson have to say that Michael Jackson, who died 10 years ago, a um, hundred million motives why they will now say he was abused, that they were abused by him, because they want the Michael Jackson estate to pay them money. That's why. That's why they said this. And J- Dan Reed has the nerve to say that Chappelle's comments made him felt physically sick? How about I was physically sick at this bullshit that you put on film that says Wade Robson and Safe Chuck saying how Michael Jackson made them spread their assholes on on a bed so he can jerk off to it. How about I'm physically disgusted by you, by by your assertions, by the way, with no evidence. There's no evidence of any of this. It's just their opinions, or I should say their uh, uh, memories of what went on. It's their memories of what happened. But there's no evidence to back any of this up. None whatsoever. None. But we're, and we're supposed to just believe that. So, yeah, I felt physically sick by the nonsense that you put out. And well, here's what Dan Reed said. I'll read you the quote. So he talks about, Dan Reed, when he went about Dan, in the light of the win, Dan Reed called Chappelle's jokes and the win of the Emmy, he said, uh, talking about. Dan Reed called Chappelle's jokes about Michael Jackson's rape accusers revolting, and he said they made him physically sick. That is according to The Independent because of uh, Dave Chappelle's Netflix special, which, by the way, is genius. Let me tell you something about this Dave Chappelle. I've always known Dave Chappelle to be an elite comedian, the upper echelon of stand-up comics. But in my mind, from the time I was 13 years old, the number one stand-up is and will always be, to me, Eddie Murphy, which, of course, makes me so elated that Eddie is now coming out and saying he is going to do stand-up again he just signed a big Netflix deal. Uh, I am I am loving every minute of it that Eddie has come out and, and said this. But Chappelle, after this last special, Sticks and Stones, let me tell you, he's right up there, man. I'd say he's like right, like a little below Eddie. Eddie's still going to be always my number one. But now Chappelle, this special's genius. And not, not just because of what he said about the uh, uh, Wade Robson and Save Chuck about the whole Michael Jackson thing. I'm just talking about the special in general with all the things he says. Chappelle is a comic. These are jokes. You take them as jokes and you, oh, it's disgusting. You shouldn't joke about that. You know what? Fuck you. Fuck you, Dan Reed, you fuck. You're so full of shit. He says, Chappelle also said that even if Michael did commit the acts, he says, this kid got his dick sucked by the king of pop. That's what Chappelle said. It was funny. He's making light of it because he doesn't fucking believe them. That's why he's saying it. He doesn't believe them. That's why he's saying this stuff, man. That's what these people don't get. That's what they don't get. So Dan Reed responded to Chappelle's routine after leaving Neverland, which documents the accounts of the alleged victims, won the Creative Arts Emmy on Saturday last week, blah, blah, blah. Chappelle is right. This is what Dan Reed says. Chappelle is riding on a wave of being contrarian, being controversial, and this, to me, was revolting. I felt physically sick listening to what he was saying. And I'm not going to reiterate how I felt physically sick by that piece of shit documentary you put out with all your lies 
and, and contradictions that have been debunked over and over again since the documentary premiered, what, in March? Is that when it premiered? And all those radio stations, I don't know if they're still not playing his music in Canada and New Zealand and all the other countries. They should be ashamed that they believe this bullshit. I don't know about them, and I don't know how the rules are and the laws are in their countries, but in this country, you are innocent until proven guilty. And if I remember correctly, Michael Jackson was acquitted in 2005 of any wrongdoing. And then how many years later? In 2005, then in 2013, so that would have been what? Uh, do the math. Eight years later was when Wade Robson first started going out saying he abused me. Eight years later, after Wade was the star witness. And I'm not going to revisit the whole thing that I talked about in my first video about how we should believe Wade now and not then and, and all the, how he's lying. And you can watch my first video and, and get the gist of all that. But now, I, you know, this Dan Reed on and on talking shit about Chappelle and how he felt physically ill when I felt physically ill. And even Chappelle says it. He goes, you know, he goes don't watch this thing. It's disgusting. And then, and then Dan Reed says that he finds Chappelle's comments disgusting. And the other thing that I realized in this documentary is how Wade Robson is so, like, emotionless, right? He doesn't, he just, like, like no emotion on his face. And Safe Chuck's pretty much the same way. They have no emotion, like, whatsoever. And I would think, and I guess everybody processes things different. So I, I, you know, but, and that's assuming that this actually happened, but I'm saying it didn't happen. But like, wouldn't you like shed a tear? Wouldn't you start to get a little bit broken up about how this person that you looked up to, that you idolized, that you, that befriended you, that did so much for you, totally betrayed you and sexually abused you. Wouldn't that bring a tear to your eye? If that really did happen, wouldn't you get a little choked up when talking about it, the thinking of this person that you loved? I mean, I'm not going to say that they didn't love the guy as if when you, how you love a, a parent or a mentor, a brother, a sister, a relative. But if, if somebody that I loved did that to me, and when I would talk about that, I get pretty choked up or I get really pissed off and they don't have any of that. They don't display any of those emotions whatsoever during this whole the interview process. They're very straight. They just say it with no emotion, no nothing. And I watched tons of interviews with Wade Robson when he was talking about how, about Michael and how much he did for him. And he was all smiles and looked like a happy guy. I guess the career was going well is when he said all that. Now that he's got no career, no nothing, he's trying to cash in. And you got to be out of your mind if you don't think that. There's the motive. They wanted money. Now, I watched this other uh, video that's on YouTube called The Lies of Leaving Neverland, and I suggest you check it out because I learned a few things about what happened when I watched this video that I didn't know. And one of them, which I found very surprising, or should I say maybe not so surprising, was that the interview with Save Chuck was shot at two different times and edited together to seem like it was a seamless interview. And the way you can tell is because of what he's wearing. So I think in the initial interview, he's wearing like a, a shirt with a, with a white T-shirt underneath it. And then there's shots with him not wearing a white T-shirt. And also, if you look, he's sitting like, it looks like sort of like a living room of a house. And you could see what looks like sliding glass doors. And you could see like a fence and some foliage. And between the shots... The foliage is different. Like they trimmed the hedges or something, something like that. And then Dan Reed, of course, then had to admit, oh, well, yeah, it was shot at two different times. 
That makes a difference. It makes a difference. Duh. You don't know that. That now you're going over every line, every little word you want to say. You make it look like it was just this one long interview when it was interview shot over several different months. That that's just it's it's you're pulling the wool over people's eyes because you have the casual fan, the people that don't pay attention, that just hear oh leaving Neverland, two guys accusing Michael Jackson of doing the most disgusting things. They knew. Dan Reed knew this was going to make headlines. Obviously, it's about Michael Jackson. You know it's going to make headlines anyway. But he knew when he put in all that disgusting detail that it was really going to make the headlines and that it was going to really make people listen. And the people that don't usually listen to anything, that's the only thing that's now going to stick in their heads. No matter how much... This documentary, or so-called documentary, as I call it, a fantasy piece, no matter how much it gets debunked, how much it gets criticized, how much all the lies come out to be untrue, all the inconsistencies come out, there is always going to be people that only heard what they heard initially when it first hit the news that Michael Jackson assaulted these two boys when they were little kids, and now that's it. He's a sexual molester, and he's dead. And what are we going to do about it except now we're not going to play his music. Now his legacy has been ruined, tarnished. But you know what? We're not going to let it get tarnished. I'm not. Not because I'm a huge Michael Jackson fan, and people might say I'm a biased person because I was a Michael Jackson fanatic. I saw him on the Bad Tour. I was, and people that know me know how much of a Michael Jackson fan I was. In fact, when Michael Jackson died, I was at work, and I don't know if I if I went over this in the last uh, the last uh, video I did, but I know. I was at work and people were calling me. People were writing me messages on Facebook, like giving me their condolences when Michael jo- died because they knew how big of a fan I was of Michael Jackson. So people might say I'm biased, but you know, if you listen to anything that I say about anything else, I like to look at things in a very fair and logical perspective. I don't jump to conclusions. I look at evidence, I research a lot of things, and I look at what people say. I look at their body language. I look at all different things. They, they call them in the gambling world, tells. You look at the tells of, is this person lying or are they really telling the truth? Besides the fact that Wade Robson in 2005 said Michael Jackson never touched him, and never did anything wrong with him. And I will say this, and I don't know where I saw this. I think it was on a comment about one of these stories. Somebody said, and, 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 you know, if you think about it, they got a point when they say this. Did you ever notice that all the people that were surrounded by Michael or that Michael surrounded himself with, all of the people that have money are the ones that are on his side saying, I never did anything wrong, and I never saw him do anything wrong. And all the people that are broke are the ones that are making the accusations that he sexually assaulted or abused them. Everybody think about it, and I go, you know what, you're right. I can't remember where I saw it, but it did make me think like, wow, that person's got a point. The broke people are going after the money, and all the people that have money aren't saying anything. They're like, yeah, he never did anything to me. He was a great friend, and... I loved the guy for 30 years, and he was always wonderful. And I can't believe they're saying these things about him. Something to think about. Another thing to think about. And I really hope that this video, like I said, like, please subscribe, and please share this. Because I want other people who may be like the casual fan or really don't do research... I'm the one doing the research now, all right? I'm the one that's telling you what's happening. So you can like and subscribe and share it to wherever you want to share it. And let me explain it out to these people. And listen, maybe it'll make them think twice. Maybe they'll say, hey, that Matt Blaze guy, he's got a point. He's got a point. That's all I want. 
I want the truth to come out. I want it to come out. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Wade Robson, you want to take a fucking lie detector test, and under the lie detector, we'll ask you the exact questions. Did Michael Jackson ever sexually abuse you? Did Michael Jackson ever make you spread your asshole so he can look at it? Did Michael Jackson put his mouth on your dick? I'll ask the questions. Or no, I'll have the 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 lie detector guy ask the specific questions. Specific. And if it comes out that you were telling the truth, I'll be the first one to say, I am sorry I didn't believe you. I'll be the first one to say it. I'm a stand-up type of guy. And if I'm wrong about something, I'll admit that I was wrong. I have no problem with that. But when I look at the evidence, when I look at things from a logical perspective, that's when I go, this is bullshit. This doesn't make sense. Think of it from just a normal person. It doesn't make sense. And I'll tell you something else that I saw. I want to talk about this too. More development. Michael Jackson's bodyguard. Guy by the name of John Branca. John Branca came out and he said, it's all nonsense. And he recalls sneaking girls into his bedroom. How about that? And that was that was from John Branca, and also I'm looking at now the article from uh, his personal trainer, Matt Fides. I don't know if I, that's how you say his name. I think that's Fittis, Fides, whatever. Uh, he was Michael's personal trainer. Uh, he was his bodyguard. I was thinking about it was John Branca. That's, an, that's the other guy. But Matt Fides is saying that he had access to Jackson and his private living areas and said staff used to sneak girls into the late pop star's bedroom. He also claimed that this whole pedophile thing is complete nonsense because Jackson was married and had girlfriends. Now, if I play devil advocate, you could say, well, it doesn't mean there's a lot of guys that were married and then they're having gay sex with other men. But I get what he's saying with that. Now, he's saying that uh, the whole pedophile thing is complete nonsense. The guy had girlfriends and had a legitimate marriage to Lisa Marie. That that was the way he lived his life. We were the people sneaking the girls into his room. So there you go. He also says that, let's see, we look at his history. He met Michael Jackson. Uh, He was a trainer from Wiltshire. Met Michael Jackson through illusionist Uri Geller. And the pair became friends. Uh, before Fides, Matt went to work for the singer who became interested in his martial arts experience. He added, they say there were boys around. That was not the case at all. He made Neverland how it was so he could have it for the Make-A-Wish Foundation, something he could good give back on. Now, that's what I said before, that there was too many people around for any of this bullshit to be going on in the first place, the way they made it sound like they had a relationship, like a boyfriend and a boyfriend, Wade Robson, like they were having sex all over Neverland. Ridiculous. He even says, this is talking about Matt Fides, the personal trainer. We had a running joke. He was never there. He had to be in Los Angeles to conduct business. It's about four-hour drive from the mountains, and he hated the drive, so he was very rarely there. He was there to make public appearances. He was much more comfortable at the Beverly Wiltshire in a suite. Yeah, how about that? That's coming from his bodyguard, right? And what else did he say? He was already recording and performing and rehearsing. For him to be messing around with young kids would be impossible because of of the security that was in place. It's impossible. He said if he was doing what he was doing to, if he was doing what he was doing to young kids, he would never get any work done. I said this. I said this before in the last video. It doesn't even make sense from a logical standpoint. Like, they think the guy's just laying around his house all day, like, hanging out in Neverland, and there's no one around, besides the, all the hundreds of staff that were there. I said the exact same thing. Now, the other pro- the other thing that I saw 
on this uh, Lies of Leaving Neverland, which I want to bring up while we're talking about it, is the train station where James Safe Chuck said he was abused. Safe Chuck said he was abused between 88 and 92. And then he says the whole thing about at the Neverland train station, right? And they go, well, wait a minute. The Neverland train station wasn't even built yet. It wasn't built until like 1994. So how could you have been abused at the train station if it wasn't even there yet? Another another lie debunked. I don't understand how these people, this is what greed does to people. This is exactly what greed does to people. It makes you nuts. And when you got hundreds of millions of dollars on the line and you go, look, all I got to do is say that this guy abused me when I was a kid. There was always allegations about him. There was always rumors of little boys, the rumors that he was gay. There was always something going on with him. If I just say he abused me, I can get some dough. They'll just want to settle it. They're not going to fight. They'll just settle it. And here's what happened. Goes to court. Thing gets tossed twice. Then finally, they get this Dan Reed to do this documentary, and now the whole world knows, and now their their case again is up, and it, 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 it's they're appealing it because it got thrown out again. Now it's in appeals, thinking that this is going to bolster their case so they can make some money because there are two of them, I, I think, are broke as fuck. They have no money, so this is the only way they can get money. Now, the other thing that did happen, by the way, talking about uh, court cases, and this is a big one, and I'm I'm very happy about this. If is that HBO um, had, was trying to get the lawsuit against them tossed out because HBO, the Michael Jackson estate, is suing HBO for this documentary and the lawsuit revolving around a 1992 non disparagement agreement between Michael Jackson and HBO. Now, if you remember back then, they aired the Dangerous Tour. And this is what the lawsuit is. The lawsuit was brought against HBO by the estate of Michael Jackson. And the judge has now ruled that it must be moved to arbitration. HBO is trying to get thrown out. And guess what? Now it's going to arbitration. So that's a win right there. Uh, The judge ruled that HBO must adhere to a 1992 arbitration agreement which stated that the network could not make disparaging remarks about the singer or do any act that may harm or disparage or cause to lower in esteem the reputation of Michael Jackson. Hey, guess what, fuckers? Now you're going to arbitration. Now you could fucking lose. Because HBO decided on their own that, hey, just because it was from 1992 and it's 27 years old, it doesn't matter anymore. Yo, guess what, HBO? Fuck you. That's what we have to say. Go fuck yourself because now you might have to pay up because you went against your own agreement, you fucking assholes, airing that piece of shit bullshit that you aired. Totally flawed so-called documentary. It's not a documentary whatsoever. Like I said, it's a piece of fantasy. Wins for wins an Emmy. It should be a shame for giving that shit an, an Emmy award. Honestly, it's just ridiculous. It's trash. Absolute trash. And then you have this Wade Robson, the same thing. These blasting Netflix about Chappelle show. You know, and, and it's, it's insane, the stuff that he's saying uh, about Chappelle. Oh, it's about abuse survivors. You know what? Fuck you, Wade. I said it before. I'll say it again. It's not about believing sexual abuse survivors, and it's not about supporting them. It's about believing that you are nothing but a money-hungry, grubby, scum-of-the-earth fucking liar. That's all it is. He's, he, he says, uh, stop shaming victims. They're not, no one's shaming victims, Wade. It's you because you're a fucking scumbag lying piece of shit. 
What about all the stuff that was left out of leaving Neverland that they didn't put in because it didn't fit the narrative? That's why Dan Reed is a fucking uh, hack documentary maker. He's a hack filmmaker because he didn't go to both sides. He didn't look at both sides of the story. I watched an interview with uh, Pierce Morgan that he did when the documentary came out. And I'm no Pierce Morgan fan, believe me. I think that's another douchebag on a whole nother level. But we'll save that story for another day, or maybe never, because who gives a fuck about Pierce Morgan? But even Pierce Morgan had the wit enough to go, well, did you talk to anybody on the other side? Like, did you talk to the family? And Dan Reed goes, no. And Pierce Morgan says, well, don't you have an obligation to? And he goes, well, the family wasn't there. And they're just going to keep saying the same things they've been saying all along. So why bother? I mean, Wade Robson and Safe Chuck, they're alive. So I'll talk to those guys. Family's not going to know anything. I mean, it's the dumbest thing I ever heard. The family was around. The, the, the kids, his nieces and nephews were around. Taz Jackson speaking about it. TJ Jackson speaking about it. They were there. You never talked to them? How about the fact that you went on and you made it look like Michael Jackson was some obsessed lunatic sending faxes, obsessed lunatic with the phone calls? Then Taz Jackson says, hey, wait a minute. My uncle did that for everyone. That was not out of the ordinary for him to send faxes and phone calls to the kids. He always did that. And I went over that in my last video. He always did that. So don't. So they're taking it out of context, which the entire documentary, or, or again, fantasy piece does, takes everything out of context, never once talks to one person, not one single person who worked for Michael Jackson, the family of Michael Jackson, no one doesn't talk to anybody who could say, hey man, I was there every day in leaving Neverland. And I can tell you right now, that didn't happen. It was not like that. It couldn't have happened. Just like the bodyguard is saying. Because it makes sense. And this is why I said this even before I read what the bodyguard said. I said it a month ago. I said it in my other video. You can go look it up. Because as a normal, intelligent, I like to think I'm somewhat intelligent, person with a brain who knows the difference between bullshit and what actually makes sense, it didn't make any sense what he was saying about, oh, we're having sex all over every room of leaving Never uh, Neverland Ranch. We're, we're all over the place. Like two young lovers who have sex all the time. That's what we were doing. Get the fuck out of here. That's exactly what I said the last time. Are you kidding me? No possible way that happened. And by the way, I said John Branca was the bodyguard. John Branca is the co-executor of the Michael Jackson estate. And what he said uh, about the Netflix, he said, Wade's accusations emerged only after his book failed, and we turned him down for a job with our Las Vegas show nine years ago. He couldn't get a job until HBO and Dan Reed hired him. Is that not motive? Is that not enough motive for Wade Robson and James Safechuck to go after the dead man's estate that's making millions and millions of dollars or to rip it down? That's what happens when big, big money's involved. And I know Michael was, was paranoid about a lot of things, and, I, and, and, and especially this. He was so paranoid because he knew he was a target. He knew it. He knew he was a target. He knew he could be taken advantage of because of the money. That's why he was a reclusive as he was. This guy didn't live a charmed life in any sense of the word because Michael Jackson was the happiest performing on stage in front of people, uh, making music videos, being an innovative, creative person. That's when he was happiest. He did not want to be on public. He couldn't be anymore. He couldn't be in, in public anymore. You don't realize as a normal, everyday person, like most of us are, that can go out to the store, to a restaurant, to anywhere, 
and be totally anonymous. Nobody gives a shit. I go outside, nobody gives a fuck who I am. Michael Jackson couldn't do that. So they make it a big deal when they say, Michael Jackson shut down Toys R Us with Macaulay Culkin, and they went uh, running through the aisle. They did it with Safe Chuck, too. And they said, get whatever you want, and they shut down the store for them. They had to shut down the store for them. Do you have any idea what kind of chaos would be caused if Michael Jackson showed up at a Toys R Us at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, how people would flock to the store, how news cameras and TV cameras and people would be there. I mean, it'd be absolutely insanity. He had to do those things. He had to do that to protect himself and the people that were around him. So you can never understand the terror that he went through as a, as a child star. I mean, I've seen videos of the Jackson 5 girls ripping at his clothes. That's terrifying when you think about it. The fans don't realize that. They love you. I mean, they're doing it out of love. But for the person, you got to realize, they know him, but he doesn't know you. We all know Michael Jackson. I know Michael Jackson, right? Even when he was alive, I knew Michael Jackson. I knew who he was. I didn't know the man personally. He didn't know me. It's terrifying for people like that. And, and and honestly, everyone wishes for, like, fame and fortune. Yeah, maybe I wish for a little bit of fame. I like to be known. I like people to know that I do this show. I like the show to become popular. I like to take the show to another level. And, of course, you know, fortune. Who doesn't want fortune? But comes what comes with fame and fortune sometimes, the downside is your privacy gets invaded constantly. And that's what you give up for that fame and fortune. And, and you can t- look at the stars of today. Look at the, 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 the big guns uh, celebrities of today. Look at guys like Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift. They go through it all the time. Like stalkers and breaking into their houses. They can't go anywhere without it being photographed. You get these guys that have these, you know, wide zoom lenses that can zoom in 10 miles. I mean, it's insane what people go through to get pictures of people, celebrities, and you're invading their lives. I mean, I would never, I, you know, if I saw a celebrity in a restaurant somewhere, I don't think I'd ever walk up to them and, and interrupt their meal and, and, and say anything to them. I'd just be like, oh, wow, that's so-and-so, and... I'd be hard pressed not to look, but like I wouldn't want to disturb them. That's just not the way that I am. The only time I ever went up to any celebrity, when I remember this was back in like the '90s, and it was a time um, I was in Orlando. It was when uh, Shaquille O'Neal was on the Magic, and they were making a run for the championship. And the great Horace Grant, remember Horace Grant? He was he was on the Bulls, then he went to the Magic. And I, he was at a club, and I saw him at the club, and I'm like, wow, it's Horace Grant. And he was just hanging out, you know, enjoying a drink. And I, I, I walked up to the guy, and I said, hey, man, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. And I put my hand out, and he said, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I shook his hand and walked away. That was it. That was my only interaction. I didn't, oh, my God, well, I didn't stand around and talk to the guy for 20 minutes. I didn't try to get an autograph. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in autographs. I, I'm, you know, maybe, maybe when I was a kid, but not now. I, you know, that was my only interaction with a celebrity. But you can't, we can't, as normal people, understand what these celebrities go through. And I think when they put out this documentary, they're pl- they're playing on that. That we think about, oh, uh, my about how these kids were sleeping in Michael's bedroom. And I said this before in the last video. Everybody's bedroom is, what, maybe a 12 by 12, 14 by 14 room or something. Michael Jackson's bedroom was, like, the size of of an apartment. It was two stories. I mean, it wasn't, like, a tiny little bedroom. They don't mention that because they want you to believe that, that he was grooming them, which is such bullshit. I actually read an article, and uh, I don't know who wrote it, and they... (laughs) They made the dumbest assertion about how 
like that Michael Jackson was grooming these kids before he ever met them. Which was saying that like because Michael was such was so good at what he did, because he was such a great entertainer and a great singer and a great dancer, that because these kids loved him so much, he was already grooming them by being an entertainer. Like his whole purpose of being an entertainer was so he can groom boys to sexually molest. It was so stupid. I read this and I go, who is this moron that would even write any piece like this? Because that's basically saying like every single groupie of any rock band, that that rock band was grooming them with their music. Because, you know, the stories about the, the, the managers or the roadies would go into the crowd and pick girls out of the crowds for these rock bands, for the, for the bands to go and have sex with in the dressing room or in the tour bus or wherever. So you're, you're basically saying that everybody who's been a fan of anyone was being groomed by that person to be taken advantage of. It's so stupid. Like, who writes that? Some people, they're not journalists. They're just idiots. And, and now with the internet and all these websites and bloggers and all this crap out there, there's more and more nonsense that comes out with people not knowing, uh, not really getting, getting the recognition from an actual news outlet. They're like, yeah, your shit sucks. We don't want you. So they put it out themselves and you get bullshit like that. That's what happens. So they're firing back at Chappelle. They're Wade Robson blasting the estate and Chappelle. And then, oh, the other thing the estate said, I want to bring this up too, because I thought this was specifically funny. So talking about uh, John Branca, the co-executive of the estate, talking about uh, to Wade how um, he didn't get the job. He actually says that when Wade criticized Chappelle, he, he says that they released the, uh, the, the John Branca goes, sorry, you weren't good enough to direct our show, which is the reason why he was turned down, Wade Robson, to direct the Michael Jackson Cirque du Soleil show. So they came out swinging after Wade went public about his displeasure with uh, Chappelle on Netflix. And Wade responded claiming it was disgusting, irresponsible, and inexcusable for Netflix to allow Dave to make like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they meant to say make light, of sexual abuse. And again, I'm not going to say, I said it already in the beginning, that I find it disgusting, irresponsible, and inexcusable for Dan Reed to put your fucking bullshit lies out there, Wade. How about that? Was it really that necessary, Wade, that you describe in great, detail how michael allegedly made you spread your asshole how he allegedly uh, sucked your dick how he allegedly had sex with you that wasn't disgusting that was that necessary in the documentary oh i think it was necessary for you to get more money for you to extort the estate of michael jackson i think that's why you had to get so graphic and disgusting Right, Dan Reed? So now Dan Reed's been put on the map with this documentary because I'd never heard of this guy beforehand. Now he's on the map. And now it's from the director who brought you leaving Neverland for whatever next project he comes up with, which I don't know what that is. But, oh, yeah, and this other guy, uh, Louis Thoreau, I guess he's some kind of director. He's a filmmaker. And he's been out, he's been in support of Wade and Robson and James Safejuck. He says that uh, Reed made a good documentary. Well, fuck you, Thoreau. Who the fuck are you? Who gives a shit, Louis Thoreau, Louis Thoreau. What the fuck your name is? He says in a recent interview on his Twitter. Who wait? How do you have an interview on your Twitter? I guess, I guess they put out a video. He again addressed Reed's documentary according to Stylist. Stylist reports he also suggested that sometime in the future he might create his own project that examines Jackson's alleged abuse. Hey, just, uh, Justin Thoreau, Louis Thoreau, you do this 
Maybe you'll fucking uncover the bullshit that your buddy Dan Reed spewed to everybody and how he lied to everyone. So yeah, maybe you should do your own documentary. A real one that examines both sides of the story like your buddy Dan Reed failed to do. How about that? Here's what he says. I thought Dan Reed, who made Leaving Neverland, did a good job. I do think there are other people whose voices need to be heard. Maybe I'll get to do that one day. What are you talking about? One day. Like, you, you're not making good documentary films? So make a good documentary then. Do something if that's what you want to do. If you want to make one about this, do it. It's one side. This, this Leaving Neverland was a one-sided, unfair documentary. They only, only took the words with no presented evidence, the words of two people. And I've said this before, and I'm say it again. Out of the hundreds and hundreds of kids that Michael Jackson has met and Michael Jackson has spent time with, three, and I'm talking about this Jordy Chandler, I'm talking about Save Chuck and Wade Robson, three. Only three are accusing him. Now, that's not to, not to say, don't get me wrong, that it couldn't have happened, right? That there was hundreds, but only three. But usually, with pedophiles, there's more than three. There's like hundreds or, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 kids. And if Michael was a true pedophile and had accessibility to all these kids all the time, I would think that probably would be more than three. Just saying. I'm just saying. That's why another, I don't believe this bullshit that these two are doing. The fuck out of here with this nonsense already. And you know what? This What's his name? Thoreau? Louis Thoreau? Make a documentary. Make a documentary that totally debunks Dan Reed's. That's what you should do. How about that? Do that. John Branca claims that Reed does not look at any other angles of the story aside from those presented by Robson and Safechuck. That is 100% true. John Branca, again, being the co-executor of the Jackson estate. Others attack the team behind the film for waiting until after Jackson passed when he can no longer defend himself to spotlight the allegations. Also true. They would have never brought this up if Michael was still alive. We know that. I know that. You know that. Everybody knows it. They would have never, never, never done it. So I wanted to get that off my chest. It's been three weeks that I've been thinking about it. My voice is back in full force. Please, again, like, share, and subscribe to the YouTube channel and share the video. And also, you know, hey, you could go to my uh, Instagram, the Matt Blaze Show. My other Instagram is uh, DJ Matt Blaze. I don't really post a lot, but you follow me. My Twitter is at DJ Matt Blaze as well. But really, I'm trying to get this thing going, and I'm going to do more topics about more things. But I want, I need subscribers. That's what it's all about in YouTube land. You know, what's the point of talking if no one's listening? And I think I got some pretty good things to say. So with that, I'm going to leave you with something very special. How about this? We are celebrating, Michael. And I'm going to leave you with one of the greatest songs ever written. Greatest Michael Jackson songs. The great Billie Jean. Here it is, Michael Jackson with Billie Jean. Once again, thank you all for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Uh, Comments are always welcomed. And until next time.